Well, good afternoon and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for an another week. Uh, what can I say, uh, starting off with uh, the fact that we had an amazing thing that was supposed to have happened on Wednesday. It was Back to the Future Day. If you've seen the movie Back to the Future 2, they were transported into the future to October 21st, 2015. That was on Wednesday. And while I know that everybody who is from that era had these visions of hoverboards and, um, and, sh and uh, shoes that self-laced, sorry, what do you think? This is Christmas? Well, Christmas is in 61 days. But um, back to the future. And then it was finally here. It's amazing to see how many things in that film actually did come to pass. Uh, I will have to say that... Um, I think I blew the timing for one thing. There's one thing that I blew the timing on. Jaws 19. I think that if I would have watched the film about three or four years ago, my producer and I could have probably put together Jaws 19. It may not have been good, but we could have put together a film, called it Jaws 19, had it in for release this week, and at least play up on the hype, even, if it, even though it would probably be a bad film. But on the other hand, when you look at Jaws 3D, it probably couldn't be much worse than that. Anyhow, we're going to continue on with the Back to the Future theme, because there were some things that were recurring themes uh, from the past that are now present, and so the present is the future of the past. So uh, we're going to start off with... Governor Mark Dayton and oil trains. Star Tribune, when was this? This is this week. This is on Thursday, the day after Back to the Future Day. Dayton, oil train risks rising. We've been telling you that for a year, almost. Since our very first show, we had mentioned the fact that the oil trains coming out of the uh, Bakken plain are carrying a lot of the hazardous gunk the oil that's highly explosive, um, all the stuff that causes the political left to fight against pipelines. And it's all about the Keystone XL pipeline. That's what started this whole thing. I asked a question. How is the oil being transported now? It's being transported through the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad and the Canadian, I think the Canadian National might be Canadian Pacific Railroad as well. So what we have is the situation where this is government uh, finally waking up to the fact that maybe a Keystone Pipeline is not a bad thing. But instead of telling the railroads, we want you to do this, we want you to do this, we want you to do this, maybe it's time to just get on board and build a pipeline. Um, I'm still wondering, but I haven't looked at the financial reports, how much money that Mark Dayton gets from uh, Warren Buffett, the owner of Burlington Northern Santa Fe. But I'm not going to run a TV show all about rail today, because I know we've beat that horse pretty dead in the past, and I know I could go on for another hour about it, but we're not going to do that today, because really, a lot of things happened this week that we want to talk about. Some of it's in the present, some of it's in the past. Again, it's Back to the Future week. Uh, and the other thing that I want to mention, again, is that you can watch all of our episodes online at youtube.com slash northstaroasis. That's important because if you live in Maplewood, you will not be able to see this TV show on the air in your homes. Maplewood city government, by a vote of 4 to 1, decided to pull out of the agreement that allows suburban community channels to broadcast this to your living rooms or your kitchens, anywhere inside your house. They're done. If you're in the city of Maplewood, you will not be able to watch this show on your television set. And this was really meant to silence the voice of the people. And I say the people, the local producers who produce content on the show. Probably not directed at me, I think it's directed at some of the other hosts who uh, have other shows. But the fact is, if you like this show, you're going to be silenced. It was a four to one vote. The lone vote of opposition was City Council Member Bob Cardinal. 
Um, so Bob's a good guy in this situation. But the other four, they all voted to sell your local programming, your locally based programming, and North Star Oasis down the drain. And so if you do happen to one event, everybody in the city government but Bob Cardinal. Well, anyhow, um, 64 more weeks. That's all we've got left until the next presidential inauguration. And a lot of things happened in this last week related to the race to succeed President Barack Obama. And so we're going to look at the first clip of the first candidate to withdraw on the Democratic ticket. And that would be former U.S. Senator Jim Webb. Fully accept that my views on many issues are not compatible with the power structure and the nominating base of the Democratic Party. That party is filled with millions of dedicated, hardworking Americans, but its hierarchy is not comfortable with many of the policies that I have laid forth, and frankly, I'm not that comfortable with many of theirs. For this reason, I'm withdrawing from any consideration of being the Democratic Party's nominee for the presidency. This does not reduce in any way my concerns for the challenges facing our country, my belief that I can provide the best leadership in order to meet these challenges, or my intentions to remain fully engaged in the debates that are facing us. How I remain as a voice will depend on what kind of support I'm shown in the coming weeks as I meet with people from all sides of America's political landscape, and I intend to do that. And Jim Webb was not the only Democrat to announce that he is withdrawing from the race. We also had former U.S. Senator and former Governor Lincoln Chafee. Now, as you may know, I've been campaigning on a platform of prosperity through peace. But after much thought, I have decided to end my campaign for the president today. Democratic presidential hopeful Lincoln Chafee announced today that he is dropping out of the race. The former governor of Rhode Island has been struggling to raise money and make an impression with voters. Though he was running as a Democrat, Chafee began his stint in politics as a Republican and later became an independent. He will be remembered in part for making the case to bring the metric system to the U.S. when he announced his campaign. During his parting speech, he stressed the need for peace and more leadership roles for women. And that women are more likely to be collaborative and team-oriented. It is undeniable the benefits women provide to the pursuit of peace. Jim Webb also dropped out this week, leaving just Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, Martin O'Malley, and Larry Lessig to fight it out for the Democratic nomination. And let's take a quick look over at the Real Clear Politics uh, average of polls for the Democrat nomination. Um, going into the withdrawal phase, uh, Martin O'Malley has 0.5% support amongst Democrats. Jim Webb, as we saw, just uh, withdrew, 1.2%. Um, Lincoln Chafee at zero. And then former uh, or current U.S. Vice President Joe Biden, 16.8%. Uh, Vermont U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders at 257 And Hillary Clinton at 47.8%. So that's the news on the Democratic side of the race as far as the polling situation is concerned. But something also happened on the Republican side just the other day. Uh, Jeb Bush... Many people who, at least larger TV pundits from the bigger news networks, all thought he was going to be the heir apparent uh, GOP nominee, is struggling. Let's take a look at the video. Jeb Bush is ordering an across-the-board pay cut for his campaign staff and is slashing spending on travel and other costs as he looks to shore up his sluggish White House bid. The moves come as the one-time frontrunner struggles to break through in a crowded Republican primary field. Bush campaign officials were told on Friday that payroll is being reduced by 40 percent, with all but the most entry-level staff taking pay cuts. The campaign is also downsizing at its campaign headquarters in Miami and offering officials positions elsewhere at a reduced salary. Officials say the staff shifts will help Bush in Iowa, New Hampshire, and other early voting states. 
So Jeb Bush is declining in support and he has to slash his payroll. Now the last time that, well, well I can't say the last time, uh, 2008, it was the end of July of 2007 for the 2008 campaign. And former, well, uh, U.S. Senator John McCain was running. He uh, was up in, the, up in the polls and he was down in the polls and then he did a retrenchment. He ended up laying off staff. He really cut a lot of things out of his budget. It did not look like he was going to survive, but somehow or another, he managed to hold on and become the nominee. So I know that that's what Jeb Bush is hoping for here, but really, McCain-esque tactics this far out is an anomaly. It's not a foregone conclusion. Here's what usually happens in the course of a nominating contest. You have a bunch of candidates of all different strengths. Uh, you, your front runner or status changes in Iowa on a repeated basis. And then you're going to start finding that the closer we get to Iowa, the closer you're going to get to candidates who are in the top tier and those who are in the bottom. And what usually happens is we start seeing movement. If a candidate is not raising the funds necessary to go the long haul, they will start retrenching. They will lay off staff, they will pull back from certain states, and then they will start drawing a line in the sand in other states. They'll start pulling staff away from some of the early key states like Iowa and New Hampshire. And those are the candidates who never win the nomination. Then you have candidates who just fight at all costs. They go through and, you know, they have a one pickup truck campaign throughout Iowa, enough to get enough cash and momentum to go on to the next stage and hope they can build a base from there. And, and we saw that with Rick Santorum, who actually won the Iowa caucuses two years ago, or four years ago. And then you have the others that play the momentum game but kind of hold back and then it just becomes a bump. Whoever gets the media bump out of Iowa at the end of the Iowa caucuses, whether they win it or not, whoever is perceived to be the winner, um, Mitt Romney was the perceived winner four years ago, even though it was Rick Santorum who actually won when they had recounted a couple of uh, counties. But that momentum bump for Romney went a long way into New Hampshire. And then from New Hampshire, he was able to ride the bump into Michigan and into South Carolina. And by that time, you get other candidates who are trying to react. They're running out of cash. And then they start retreating into South Carolina. Oh, like Rudy Giuliani is a classic case of this. When he ran for the nomination back in 2008, just before Iowa, he says, I'm not going to do anything in Iowa and New Hampshire. I'm going to go straight to South Carolina. He put all of his resources in South Carolina. Well, by the time the race shifted to the focus of South Carolina, he wasn't pol polling very well. He lost the momentum. And then he said, I'm going to go to Florida. And he puts all of his eggs in the Florida basket. And by the time the campaign caught up to putting Florida under the microscope, Rudy Giuliani was even going lower in the polls. At that point in time, Giuliani got smart and said, hey, I'm not going to win this. Let's just get out now. And that's what we're going to see in the nomination contest on the Republican side. You're going to see candidates shifting their focus, shifting their money, uh, eliminating staff, reducing staff, increasing staff. And that's how you're going to tell who's really leading in the polls. And I'm not talking about the telephone polls. And, you know, I report on Real Clear Politics average polls all the time. I'm going to just go through a couple of uh, key things on the Republican side right now. Uh, Donald Trump, 27.2% nationally on the Real Clear Politics average of polls. Uh, ben Carson, 21.4%. Uh, Marco Rubio, 9.2%. Uh, Ted Cruz, 7.8%. Uh, Jeb Bush, 7.2%. Carly Fiorina is at 54 and Mike Huckabee at 4.0, and Rand Paul at 3.2. And by that time, anybody else who is lower than 3.2, I'm not even going to mention them to, uh, today. But that is, you know, that is where we're sitting at. Uh, Jeb Bush, unlike the others, he does have a fairly narrow ba uh, donor base, but they're of large donors. So he's got the money, 
But what I'm not sure that he has is the ground game necessary in states like Iowa and New Hampshire to compete in the long haul. Maybe he does, and he'll just say, well, we just got to wait a little bit, and we'll, we'll see what happens. 7.2% national polls, not necessarily sure that Jeb is going to make it. But on the other hand, you know, uh, I really thought that John McCain would have been dead in the water in July of 07 also, and I was, you know, he defied the odds there. Anyhow, um, there was another thing that occurred in the 2016 presidential race this week. So we're going to go right back to the clip. This one goes back to the Democrat side as former, oh, I keep saying former, probably because he's going to be former, but Vice President Joe Biden has made an announcement. Good morning, folks. Please, please sit down. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you for lending me the Rose Garden for a minute. It's a pretty nice place. <laughs> As my family and I have worked through the, uh, the grieving process, uh, I've said all along uh, what I've said time and again to others, uh, that it may very well be that that process, uh, uh, by the time we get through it, uh, closes the window on mounting a realistic campaign uh, for president, that it might close. I've concluded it has closed. I know from previous experience that there is no timetable for this process. The process doesn't respect or much care about things like filing deadlines or debates and primaries and caucuses. But I also know that uh, I could do this if the, I couldn't do this if the family wasn't ready. The good news is the family has reached that point. But as I've said many times, my family has suffered loss, and, uh, and I, uh, I hope there would come a time, and I've said this to many other families, that sooner rather than later, when, uh, when you think of your loved one, it brings a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eyes. Well, that's where the Bidens are today, thank God. Bo, uh, Bo is our inspiration. Unfortunately, I believe we're out of time, the time necessary to mount a winning campaign for the nomination. But while I will not be a candidate, I will not be silent. I intend to speak out clearly and forcefully to influence as much as I can where we stand as a party and where we need to go as a nation. And this is what I believe. I believe that President Obama has led this nation from crisis to recovery, and we're now on the cusp of resurgence. And I'm proud to have played a part in that. This party, our nation, will be making a tragic mistake if we walk away or attempt to undo the Obama legacy. The American people have worked too hard, and we've come too far for that. Well, there's Joe Biden, our current U.S. Vice President. The interesting thing about his announcement that he's not going to seek the White House in 2016. First of all, he is right about the window of opportunity, that he's concluded that that window has closed. Um, the 24th of October today, yeah, it's pretty much closed. Um, the one thing that I found really odd about uh, Vice President Biden's speech was that I think it was like 23 minutes in length. That's a long speech. But instead of coming out and giving all of the public policy things, he led first, he led off with he's not seeking election to the presidency. And then he went on to give the what if. But if I was president this, and if I was president that, and uh, the Obama-Biden administration did this, wouldn't you normally come out and do that first We've done this, I support this, I'm defending this, 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 but hey, our family concerns are first and I'm not running. That would have probably been a little more appropriate way of handling the speech, but you've got the Rose Garden and you do what with it? You do a speech backwards. In all defense though, I really think that Joe Biden wanted to run. I think even at this late stage he was planning on running. Uh, I do believe firmly that he was told that he shouldn't run. 
Uh, I think that was the, his boss, President Obama, told him, Joe, you're not the man. We've got somebody else in mind. And that's why we had a 23-minute speech in the Rose Garden with President Obama standing there by his side talking about how nice of a place the Rose Garden is. And it is a nice place. Uh, but I really think that that's what happened, is that Joe Biden wanted to run and was pulled aside and said, no, you're not going to get the nominee. You're not going to be the nominee. You might as well not even consider it because you won't get there. I really think that that conversation was held. Um, Biden is the one who had given the, he, he's the, he's the source of the leak about uh, on his deathbed, his son, Bo Biden, telling him that, you know, you should run. If this is coming from Joe Biden about his deceased son, who really should be the person running. Unfortunately, uh, Bo Biden did suck him to cancer. But if Joe Biden is going to use his son in that manner, I think in his heart he was going to run. And now we know he's not. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Martin O'Malley, 0.5%. He's irrelevant. The, in the clip we played, they mentioned one other guy. He's so far down there that he probably polls in the negative, that he needs to pay people to, to vote for him in order to uh, have any shot at anything. Now, a Democrat paying people to vote, that's probably not unheard of. Uh, there have been numerous cases where we've heard of that, but you know, I don't even know who, who that other person is that they're talking about. And he doesn't show up on real clear politics. He, his, his name is not out there. He's a nobody who is not going to be president. So it's going to be Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton getting the nomination. And that's what we're going to be staying tuned to see. But there's another bit, and we're going to go back to the future now. This is from 2012 because Vice President Biden and Congressman Paul Ryan met up head-to-head -head in the vice presidential debate in 2012. We're going to show you a little clip. We should always stand up for peace, for democracy, for individual rights. And we should not be imposing these devastating defense cuts because what that does when we equivocate on our values, when we show that we're cutting our own defense, it makes us more weak. It projects weakness, and when we look weak, our adversaries are much more willing to test us. They're more brazen in their attacks, and our allies are less willing to With trust us. With all due respect, that's a bunch of malarkey. And why fact, is that so? Because not a single thing he said is accurate. First of all... Be specific. I will be very specific. Number one, the, uh, this lecture on embassy security. The congressman here cut embassy security in his budget by $300 million below what we asked for, number one. So much for the embassy security piece. Number two, Governor Romney, before he knew the facts, before he even knew that our ambassador was killed, he was out making a political statement which was panned by the media around the world. We will not allow the Iranians to get a nuclear weapon. What Bibi held up there was, when they get to the point where they can enrich uranium enough to put into a weapon, they don't have a weapon to put it into. Let's all calm down a little bit here. Iran is more isolated today than when we took office. It was on the ascendancy when we took office. It is totally isolated. This is the world's largest sponsor of, of terrorism. That's They've dedicated the themselves to wiping an entire country off the map. They call us the great Satan. And if they get nuclear weapons, other people in the neighborhood will pursue their nuclear weapons as well. Vice President We Biden. can't live with that. Let's look at uh, where we were when we came to office. The economy was in free fall. We had the Great Recession hit. Nine million people lost their job. $1.6 trillion in wealth lost in equity in your homes and retirement accounts for the middle class. We knew we had to act for the middle class. We immediately went out and rescued General Motors. We went ahead and made sure that we cut taxes for the middle class. And in addition to that, when that, ha and when that occurred, what did Romney do? Romney said, no, let Detroit go bankrupt. We moved in and helped people refinance their homes. Governor Romney said, no, let foreclosures hit the bottom. Did they come in and inherit a tough situation? Absolutely. <laughs> but we're going in the wrong direction. Look at where we are. The economy is barely limping along. It's growing at 1.3%. That's slower than it grew last year, and last year was slower than the year before. 
Job growth in September was slower than it was in August, and August was slower than it was in July. We're heading in the wrong direction. 23 million Americans are struggling for work today. 15% of Americans are living in poverty today. This is not what a real recovery looks like. Mitt Romney's a good man. He cares about 100% of Americans in this country. And with respect to that quote, I think the vice president very well knows that sometimes the words don't come out of your mouth the right way. <laughs> <laughs> but I always say what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And we so does Romney. We want everybody to succeed. We want to get people out of poverty, in the middle class, onto a life of self-sufficiency. We believe in opportunity and upward mobility. That's what we're going to push for in a Romney administration. Uh, the idea, if you heard that, that uh, little soliloquy on 47%, you think he just made a mistake, then I think you're, I, 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 I think I got a bridge to, to sell you. Here's the problem. They got caught with their hands in the cookie jar, turning Medicare into a piggy bank for Obamacare. Their own actuary from the administration came to Congress and said, one out of six hospitals and nursing homes are gonna go out of business as a result of this. That's not what they said. 7.4 million seniors are projected to lose the current Medicare Advantage coverage they have. That's a $3,200 benefit cut. That didn't what we're happen. saying, more people signed these are up. from your own more, actuaries. More, blah, blah, blah. more people signed mm. up for Medicare Advantage after what, the change. What they're no, saying, nobody is Mr. Vice President, down. I know, no, no, this Mr. Time, Vice President, this is I know little... you're under a lot of duress to make up for lost <laughs> ground, but I think people will be better served if we don't keep interrupting each other. So that was 2012 vice presidential debate, and we had uh, Paul Ryan versus Joe Biden. Joe Biden announced he's not running for president, but here's the news on the Paul Ryan front. It looks like Paul Ryan may become Speaker of the House of Representatives. Let's go to the film. The speculation, the closed-door negotiations, the pressure to run all came to an end minutes ago when Paul Ryan agreed to run to become Speaker of the House, the third highest office in the land. And we just received a copy of that letter that he sent to his Republican colleagues saying in part, I never thought I'd be Speaker, but I pledge to you that if I could be a unifying figure, then I would serve. I would go all in. And after talking with so many of you and hearing your words of encouragement, I believe we are ready to move forward as one, a united team, and I am ready and eager to be our speaker. <coughs> now, Ryan has insisted on the support of three Republican House groups. He met earlier today with what's known as the Tuesday Group, also met with the Republican Study Committee made up of 170 mainstream House conservatives, and those two, along with the House Freedom Caucus, which voted last night to support him, fulfills the conditions that Ryan laid down, clearing the way for him to run for the chamber's top job. Now, the website Politico is reporting that Ryan did make one concession to delay a change in House rules governing the Speaker. But also today, Governor Scott Walker, a close friend of Ryan's, told reporters that he talked to the congressman and advised him to set his own terms for the Speaker's job. If people are really serious about recruiting him, he should change the terms and say, if you want me, I'm going to make sure I don't have to give up the time I cherish with my family. Uh, he should change the terms and saying. Instead of relying on the old way things were done, he should say, we're going to build more consensus. It appears that is exactly how it's all playing out. The House is scheduled to vote on a new speaker one week from today. If he's elected, Paul Ryan would be the first congressman from Wisconsin to become Speaker of the House. This and uh, the thing about Paul Ryan, uh, this, he came about really after a movement was underway to get Newt Gingrich as the Speaker of the House. Uh, Ginrich was this, the former speaker uh, back during the Clinton administration, the Bill Clinton administration. And people were looking at Newt saying, you know, Newt, he, he kind of did things a little differently than we're doing now back then, and they work. So, you know, maybe Newt wouldn't be a bad, uh, bad choice for speaker. And the thing is, with the Speaker of the House, you do not need to be a sitting member of Congress to become the Speaker of the House. So to reach back to the former Speaker to become the current Speaker was not a bad thing. But it was Gingrich who said no to those who were pushing him. And it was also Jim DeMint. And Gingrich and DeMint were really trying, really behind the move to get 
Uh, and Jim DeMint, currently with the Heritage Foundation, he was a former U.S. Senator as well. Uh, but, you know, these guys were pushing to get Paul Ryan as the Speaker. Paul Ryan seems to be the one person who can unite the Republican Party. Now, here's the difference between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to members of Congress. You have the Republican side, a lot of free-thinking people who come from the diverse perspectives in, uh, within the Republican Party. You know, you've got your social uh, conservatives, you've got your libertarians, you've got your moderates. And they come from all different regions of the country. They're all A personalities. They're all free thinkers. And they're all, you know, nobody's ever seen in the Republican Party ever seems to be happy with whoever is leading the, the pack. I mean, that's just the way it is. We see that here. Nobody, you know, people aren't happy with the state Republican Party chairman just because he's a state Republican Party chairman. And that's the way Republicans are. And for Paul Ryan to be able to go to the moderates and to the conservatives and to the social conservatives and the libertarians and say, hey, if, I'm, if you want a speaker and you want me to be the speaker, then I need unity here. And I really think that that shows leadership on behalf of Paul Ryan. I also think that finding that consensus and enlisting the help of Jim DeMint and Newt Gingrich, I think also helps on the leadership um, Front. And so I'm kind of waiting here. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a consensus similar to the Israeli government. Uh, but that's what you see in the Republican Party right now is one person rising to the front and that person is trying to get every single, the viewpoint of every single coalition within the Republican Party aboard. Whereas on the Democrat side, it's a top down thing where you get the Speaker of the House, uh, who in the past has been Nancy Pelosi, who pretty much dictates the terms for all of the members down below. And it's a top-down mentality, whereas the Republican Party is more of a bottom-up. And that's really the perspectives that you see within the way that both the Democrats and the Republicans operate their respective caucuses in the U.S. House of Representatives, and really the Senate, too. Uh, even though the Senate is a much different creature. But, you know, in the House, you know, the Republicans are free thinkers, and they're the ones who are saying, we want this, and we're not going to support you unless we get that. The Democrats, well, what, is the, what does leadership want me to do? That's really the difference in mentalities. But now, if Newt Gingrich would have been the Speaker of the House, that really would have been back to the future. But Gingrich, as we see, is not going to be the Speaker. But we also had another thing uh, that occurred this week. First of all, uh, best of luck to Paul Ryan. Uh, it's going to be a tough, demanding job for anybody who is in the Speaker of the House position, regardless of the party and regardless of whether they're a current sitting member of Congress or not. Good luck to Paul Ryan. If you become the Speaker, best of luck to you because it's a demanding job and nobody, it's like herding cats and nobody's going to be happy. So best of luck to our neighbor to the east. But now we also had another thing that came, uh, came up this week. The Benghazi committee had met again and um, former Secretary of State and current Democrat presidential candidate Hillary Clinton was up on the stand for something like eight or nine hours. Ouch. So how did she do? Well, we're going to take a look at one line of questioning from Congressman Jim Jordan from Ohio. C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you just gave a long answer, Madam Secretary, to Ms. Sanchez about what you heard that night, what you're doing, but nowhere in there did you mention a video. You didn't mention a video because there was never a video-inspired protest in Benghazi. There was in Cairo, but not in Benghazi. Victoria Nuland, your spokesperson at the State Department, hours after the attack said this, Benghazi has been attacked by militants in Cairo. Police have removed demonstrators. Benghazi, you got weapons and explosions. Cairo, you got spray paint and rocks. One hour before the attack in Benghazi, Chris Stevens walks the diplomat to the front gate. The ambassador didn't report a demonstration. 
He didn't report it because it never happened. An eyewitness in the command center that night on the ground said no protest, no demonstration. Two intelligence reports that day. No protest, no demonstration. The attack starts at 3.42 Eastern time, ends at approximately 11.40 p.m. that night. At 4.06, an ops alert goes out across the State Department. It says this, mission under attack, armed men, shots fired, explosions heard. No mention of a video, no mention of a protest, no mention of a demonstration. But the best evidence is Greg Hicks, the number two guy in Libya, the guy who worked side by side with Ambassador Stevens. He was asked if there had been a protest would the ambassador have reported it? Mr. Hicks' response, absolutely. For there to have been a demonstration on Chris Stevens' front door and him not to have reported it is unbelievable, Mr. Hicks said. He said, secondly, if it had been reported, he would have been out the back door within minutes and there was a back gate. Everything points to a terrorist attack. We just heard from Mr. Pompeo about the long history of terrorist incidents, terrorist violence in the country. And yet five days later, Susan Rice goes on five TV shows, and she says this, Benghazi was a spontaneous reaction as a consequence of a video. A statement we all know is false, but don't take my word for it. Here's what others have said. Rice was off the reservation, off the reservation on five networks, White House worried about the politics. Republicans didn't make those statements. They were made by the people who work for you in the Near Eastern Affairs Bureau, the actual experts on Libya in the State Department. So, if there's no evidence for a video-inspired protest, then where'd the false narrative start? It started with you, Madam Secretary. At 10.08, on the night of the attack, you released this statement. Some have sought to justify the vicious behavior as a response to inflammatory material posted on the internet. At 10.08, with no evidence, at 10.08, before the attack is over, at 10.08, when Tyrone Woods and Glenn Doherty are still on the roof of the annex fighting for their lives, the official statement of the State Department blames a video. Why? During the day on September 11th, as you did mention, Congressman, there was a very large uh, protest against our embassy in Cairo. Protesters breached the walls. They tore down the uh, American flag. Uh, and it was of grave concern to us because the inflammatory video had been shown on Egyptian television, which has a broader uh, reach than just inside Egypt. And if you look at what I said, I referred to the video that night in a very specific way. I said, some have sought to justify the attack because of the video. I use those words deliberately, not to ascribe a motive to every attacker, but as a warning to those across the region uh, that uh, there was no justification for further attacks. And in fact, uh, during the course of that week, uh, we had many attacks that were all about the video. We had people breaching the walls of our embassies in Tunis and Khartoum. We had people, Madam thankfully Secretary. not Americans, dying Secretary at Clinton. Um, protests. But that's what was going on, Congressman. Secretary Clinton, I appreciate most of those attacks were after the attack on the uh, facility in, in Benghazi. You mentioned Cairo. It was interesting what else Ms. Uh, Ms. Newland said that day. She said, uh, if pressed by the press, if there's a connection between Cairo and Benghazi, she said this, there's no connection between the two. So here's what troubles me. Your experts knew the truth. Your spokesperson knew the truth. Greg Hicks knew the truth. But what troubles me more is I think you knew the truth. I want to show you a few things here. You're looking at an email you sent to your family. Here's what you said. At 11 o'clock that night, approximately one hour after you told the American people it was a video, you say to your family, two officers were killed today in Benghazi by an Al-Qaeda-like group. You tell you tell the American people one thing, you tell your family an entirely different story. Also, on the night of the attack, you had a call with the president of Libya. Here's what you said to him. Ansar al-Sharia is claiming responsibility. It's interesting, Mr. Katala, 
one of the guys arrested and charged, actually belonged to that group. And finally, and most significantly, the next day, within 24 hours, you had a conversation with the Egyptian prime minister. You told him this, we know the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film. It was a planned attack, not a protest. Let me read that one more time. We know, not we think, not it might be, we know the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film. It was a planned attack, not a protest. State Department experts knew the truth. You knew the truth, but that's not what the American people got. And again, the American people want to know why. Why didn't you tell the American people exactly what you told the Egyptian prime minister? Well, I think if you look at the statement that I made, I clearly said that it was an attack, and I also said that there were some who tried to justify Secretary it Clinton, on, the call, basis, on the basis of the video, Congressman, and I but, think but, it's... But, but, and, but real quick, calling it an attack is like saying the sky's blue. Of course it was an attack. Well, you know, I mean, it we shortly, want to know the truth. This, the statement you sent out was a statement on Benghazi, and you say vicious behavior as a response to inflammatory material on the internet. If that's not pointing as the motive of being a video, I don't know what is. And that's, certainly what, and that's certainly how the American people saw it. Well, well, Congressman, there was a lot of conflicting information that we were trying to make sense of. The situation was very fluid. It was fast moving. There was also a claim of responsibility by Ansar al-Sharia. And when I talked to the Egyptian prime minister, I said that this was uh, a claim of responsibility by Ansar al-Sharia, by a, uh, a group that was affiliated or at least wanted to be affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Sometime after that, the next, next day, early the next morning after that, on the 12th or 13th, they retracted their claim of responsibility. Madam Secretary? And I think if, if you look at what all of us were trying to do, and we were in a position, Congressman, of trying to make sense of a lot of incoming information and Madam watch the way the intelligence community tried to make sense of it. Madam Secretary? And so all I can there was say not is nobody... There was not conflicting information the day of the attack because your press secretary said, if pressed, there's no connection between Cairo and Benghazi. It was clear. You're the ones who muddied it up, not the, not the information. Well, there's no connection. Here's what, here's what I think is going on. Here's what I think is going on. Let me show you one more slide. Again, this is from Victoria Nuland, your press person. She says to Jake Sullivan... Philippe Rhinus. Subject line reads this. Romney's statement on Libya. Email says, this is what Ben was talking about. I assume Ben is the now somewhat famous Ben Rhodes author of the Talking Points memo. This email is at 1035, 27 minutes after your 1008 statement. 27 minutes after you've told everyone it's a video, while Americans are still fighting because the attack's still going on, your top people are talking politics. Seems to me that night you had three options, Secretary. You could tell the truth, like you did with your family, like you did with the Libyan president, like you did with the Egyptian prime minister. Tell them it was a terrorist attack. You could say, you know what, we're not quite sure. Don't, don't really know for sure. I don't, I don't think the evidence is there. I think it's all in the first one, but you could have done that. But you picked a third option. You picked the video narrative. You picked the one with no evidence, and you did it because Libya was supposed to be, as Mr. Rostam pointed out, this great success story for the Obama White House and the Clinton State Department. And a key campaign theme that year was GM's alive, bin Laden's dead, Al-Qaeda's on the run. And now you have a terrorist attack. And it's a terrorist attack in Libya, and it's just 56 days before an election. You can live with a protest about a video. That won't hurt you but a terrorist attack will. So you can't be square with the American people. You can tell your family it's a terrorist attack, but not the American people. You can tell the President of Libya it's a terrorist attack, but not the American people. And you can tell the Egyptian Prime Minister it's a terrorist attack, but you can't tell your own people the truth. Madam Secretary, Americans can live with the fact that Good people sometimes give their lives for this country. They don't like it. They mourn for those families. They pray for those families. But they can live with it. 
But what they can't take, what they can't live with, is when their government's not square with them. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, you're welcome to answer the question if you would like to. Thank well, I wrote a whole chapter about this in my book, Hard Choices. I'd be glad to send it to you, Congressman, because I think the insinuations uh, that you are making do a grave disservice to the hard work that people in the State Department, the intelligence community, the Defense Department, the White House did during the course of some very confusing and difficult days. There is no doubt in my mind that we did the best we could with the information that we had at the time. And if you actually go back and read what I said that night, I, I, was very, I was very careful in saying that some have sought to justify. In fact, the man that has been arrested as one of the ringleaders of what happened in Benghazi, Ahmed Abu Qatala, is reported to have said it was the video that motivated him. None of us can speak to the individual motivations of those terrorists uh, who uh, overran our compound and who attacked our CIA annex. There were probably a number of different motivations. I think the intelligence community, which took the lead on trying to sort this out, as they should have, went through a series of interpretations and analysis. And we were all guided by that. We were not making up the intelligence. We were trying to get it, make sense of it, and then to share it. When I was speaking to the Egyptian prime minister or in the other two um, examples you showed, we had been told by Ansar al-Sharia that they took credit for it. It wasn't until about 24 or more hours later that they retracted taking credit for Secretary it. Clinton. We also knew, Congressman, because my responsibility was for what was happening throughout the region. I needed to be talking about the video because I needed to be putting other governments and other people on notice that we were not going to let them get away with attacking us as they did in Tunis, as they did in Khartoum. And in Tunis, there were thousands of demonstrators who were there only because of the video, breaching the walls of our embassy, burning down the American school. I was calling everybody in the Tunisian government I could get, and finally President Marzouki sent his presidential guard to break it up. There were as example after example. That's what I was trying to do during those very desperate and difficult uh, Clinton, hours. If I could, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Clinton, you said my insinuation. I'm not insinuating anything. I'm, I'm reading what you said. Plain language. We know the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film. That's as plain as it can get. That's vastly different than vicious behavior justified by internet material. Why didn't you just speak plain to the American people? I did. If you look at my statement, as opposed to what I was saying to the Egyptian prime minister, I did state clearly, and I said it again in more detail the next morning, as did the president. I'm sorry that it doesn't fit your narrative, Congressman. I can only tell you what the facts were, and the facts as the Democratic uh, members have pointed out in their most recent uh, collection of them uh, support this process that was going on where the intelligence community was pulling together information. And it's very much harder to do it these days than it used to be because you have to monitor social media for goodness sakes. That's where the Ansar al-Sharia uh, claim was uh, placed. I think the intelligence community did the best job they could and we all did our best job to try to figure out what was going on and then to convey uh, that to the American people. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair, we now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff. I wanted to show the entire clip of the exchange between uh, Jim Jordan and Hillary Clinton from uh, Thursday's uh, Benghazi committee hearing because everything you normally see on your regular network news is just excerpts. You'll see a couple statements from uh, Jordan, you'll see a couple of statements from Hillary, but you don't really see the full thing in the complete context. And one thing that, if you've been a regular viewer of the show that you know, is that I like to give you a larger context. That's why sometimes we have longer clips, but it's important, I think, for you to be able to see the entire exchange to draw your own conclusions. I have my conclusions, but they may not necessarily mesh with yours and your perspective. So that's why I want to make sure you saw the complete thing. 
Uh, but this is also a back to the future moment. That seems to be the theme of our show today. Because I hear from Democrats all the time that, oh, this is an expensive thing. Uh, it's, it's only politics. It reeks of pure politics. There's nothing behind this. And just move on. But I kind of remember something that happened in 1987. Does anybody remember the name Oliver North? If you recall Oliver North, ask any Democrat or even an independent who at one time has a, de uh, a Democrat lean to them, ask of whether or not Oliver North should ever have been president. And they will tell you, oh my Lord, no. But that's because Oliver North was on the receiving end of what Hillary Clinton is now receiving. This was back in 1987. So we're going to play you one little clip as a way of, um, of uh, just showing you the, uh, the context, between, uh, the comparison contrast between these two hearings. There's been testimony that uh, several thousand dollars uh, was spent on a fence uh, security system that was uh, put in at your residence and that the monies to pay for it uh, came from General Secord uh, and my question to you is were you aware I take it there was a, fan, a, a security system put in at your residence there is a security system in at my residence it has since uh, this April been sufficiently supplemented that it is now extraordinary And I take it, were you, were you aware that that security system was paid for by General Secord? Well, I'm, I'm going to waffle an answer. I'm going to say yes and no. And if you indulge me, I will give you another one of my very straightforward but rather lengthy answers. The issue of the security system was first broached immediately after a threat on my life by Abu Nidal. Abu Nidal is, as I'm sure you on the intelligence committees know, the principal foremost assassin in the world today. He is a brutal murderer. When I was first alerted to that threat by the Federal Bureau of Investigation in late April, I was simply told that there was a threat that had been promulgated by Abu Bakr, who is the press spokesman for the Fatah Revolutionary Council, which is the name of the Abu Nidal group. He targeted me for assassination. We then made an effort over the course of several days to have the story killed and not run in U.S., not me, but the story, killed and not run on the U.S. media. Nonetheless, it ran, and I believe the date was the 28th of April. The initial assessment was that this was a response to the attack on Libya, which we had run a uh, preemptive counter-terrorist raid on Libya on the 14th of April, which I had a small role to play. CBS chose to run the film anyway. The FBI was then contacted again and told asked what protection can be offered. The FBI correctly said, we don't offer protection. I then sought other types of protection. I went to my superiors and said, what can be done? Contrary to what was said some days ago, this lieutenant colonel was not offered at that time any protection by the government of the United States, Senator Rudman. I asked for it, and I was told that the only thing that I could do is to immediately PCS, permanent change of station, you and I as Marines know well what that means, and jerked out of our home and sent to Camp Lejeune. In that I was preparing at the time to go to Tehran, and we didn't want to tell the whole world that, that was deemed not to be an appropriate thing to do. The next thing that we looked at trying to do was to find a secure telephone to put in my home to justify the installation of a U.S. government security system. That, too, was impossible or not feasible or couldn't be done. 
the next thing I did was to ask for a list of who installs these things for, for the US government. Maybe I can get a better price by calling them. I believe it was someone in the Secret Service gave me a list of three or four of these companies that do that kind of installation. I called two or three of them. It is now late April, early May. It's within days of this threat. And I called and I asked, can you come out and do a survey and give me an estimate? And in each case, I think it was two or three of them, and I was at that point relatively busy. I was told it'll be several weeks before we can come out and do an estimate and a survey, and it'll be several more weeks or months before we can complete the installation, because after all, summertime is our busy time. At some point along in there, either General Secord raised with me or I raised with him this threat, and I told him I couldn't get U.S. government protection, I couldn't find a contractor to come out and do it myself, and he said, don't worry about that. I've got a good friend or an associate, I don't remember the words, who's an expert. This guy. Well, that was from 19, uh, 1987, I believe it was July, uh, July 6th or July 8th, 1987. Um, the, the moral of the story, if you go back to uh, Iran-Contra, what was it? It was gun running in the Middle East, and Oliver North was the central figure, and the Democrats wanted to impeach President Ronald Reagan over that scenario. And it didn't happen, but there was the Oversight Committee, and we just played a quick excerpt from that. And what are we seeing now? We're seeing that the Republicans want to go after Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton based upon essentially the same thing, gun running in the Middle East, or North Africa in this case. There's, uh, it reminds me of Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1, verse 9. I don't use scripture on the show much, but what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. This is just the way politics works in Washington. And if you like Hillary Clinton, you're going to be in favor of Hillary Clinton no matter what she says, whether she's telling you the truth or whether she's telling you the lie. If you are a Republican, you're going to love Oliver North, and you're, going, and you're a Democrat, you're going to hate Oliver North for the same reason. And so, really, there's nothing new here, folks. The hearing, I think, should continue, because I do believe that we should find the truth. But at the same time, I don't think at this point in time, with 64 more weeks before the next inauguration, that President Barack Obama is the target. Now, could Hillary Clinton be the target? Yeah, probably, possibly. But here's the thing. As an American, I just want the truth. I wanted the truth in 1987 over Iran-Contra. I think we should have the truth over Benghazi. Whatever that truth may be. But um, I am going to also break in as we end the show with um, a little bit of bad news. Maureen O'Hara has passed away. Last night at the age of 95, she was, uh, okay, we are playing it here. So I'll let this speak for itself. Maureen O'Hara, the red-headed beauty whose presence was felt through the camera, has passed away. She died asleep in her home at 95 years old in Boise, Idaho on Saturday, October 25, 2015. O'Hara is remembered through the many roles she played on the big screen, most notably Miracle on 34th Street. Would you please tell her that you're not really Santa Claus? that there actually is no such person. She was talented at a young age and went to the prestigious Abbey Theater when she was 14 years old. Maureen O'Hara was born Maureen Fitzsimmons in Dublin, Ireland. Her first film in America was The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1939. You've been kind to me. I kneel before you, innocent of crime. I believe you. And can't forget the parent trap. You hey, gotta turn up now. Well, what are you doing here? If you just stop screaming, I shall explain, Dad. Well, that's our show for the week. We'll see you next week. <laughs>